historical look back, what happened, why are we where we are with East versus the West, right? And the download I got this morning was you really need to focus on the role of reincarnation because it seems as if that really got wiped out by the church in in the 400s or so and that was that was a very sad thing i remember how long it took me to accept reincarnation i was i was in college and i was dating a person from vietnam actually and to him it was a no brainer you know we say we believe in god and it's a no brainer the the same kind of attitude about reincarnation and it took me so long to turn myself around and say you know maybe you're right i mean it literally took me to where i was remembering scenes from uh past lives so i i just couldn't accept the concept based on all the schooling I had had up to that time. And if you do not accept reincarnation, whatever I teach makes no sense because it takes eons to achieve it. You know, the, the people who sell um, books and webinars right now are people who say, this is a magical thing that will happen to everyone in an instant. And I go like, you're so wrong. <laughs> but um, if people don't believe in reincarnation already, how how could they go for anything I say when it, it takes so many lifetimes to build that character, to build that discipline, to build that taming of the self and, and get up there and, and be with a spiritual side? So... You know, and I was listening to one of these this morning, and it's all wonderful, but they assume a universe where everybody is, is um, the, the unhappiness you experience is the equivalent of what the middle class in America experiences. And that is so far from the truth, you know. You, your issues are not the waiter who went to lunch and wasn't there to serve you. There is much deeper issues than than that to to overcome. And I think the events right now in Palestine are, are showing that dimension. And as was Ukraine earlier and all the other Cold Wars we've been involved in and and watching the people in our army come back home and have all these post-traumatic syndromes that haunt them to their death, literally, right? Um, so I I just, after I finished putting this together, I realized that I only have one liner on reincarnation here, and it's really, really key to understand the difference that with the advent of St. Augustine, who begins this passivity around faith that, you know, there is grace and it will come to you and um, just give yourself up to, to that hope or belief or whatever. And it, it, it is, it is not, it is not that way. There is um, the, the, the path, especially when I think of the path of forgiveness that, that has to happen is is very deep so i i do agree we're all experiencing um a release from the law of karma in the sense that we're no longer in its prison so you're no longer to live in guilt and and shame but you can stand up and and do things like that that your spirit inspires you to do that is very true those walls have been busted, but they were busted, in my belief, by Christ. And they were busted at the universal level 
not at the individual level. The busting at the individual level still needs to happen by each one of us, individually, at our own time. So I'm, I'm even watching on TV now some advertising about the ascension and how people will begin to popping out and disappearing. Um, and I'm like, no, I, I really don't believe that it's happening that way. I don't know. That it's If you think about it, it's a very materialistic approach to the topic that the West now is taking. It's like, okay, how do I spread the hope of salvation? I tell people you won't have to go through the trauma that's coming to everybody else because you will be raptured. It's it's a materialistic way of thinking about it. And and they they talk about spirit in a materialistic way, in in my opinion. Okay. So one thing I wanted to show here, and it took me a long time to get to it, is that ancient Greece believed in reincarnation. Plato, Socrates taught the soul needs to evolve because there is this thing called, they don't call it karma, they call it paying your debt to, or your trespasses to, to those you trespass. And <clears throat> at some point between 325 AD and the 400s, all of that was pluck, plugged out. <clears throat> so, I need to drink something. <clears throat> So what I wanted to start with is some very basic concepts we have, <laughs> like the concept of the spine. Look how we divide the spine. We divide it exactly the same way as the chakras. That is not an accident. It's all of these knowledge was a lot more universal in antiquity and the sages would get together um, either in the physical or in the spiritual domain and and co coalesce in in what the learning is to be. So it's I, I show this only because it well, I, I have gone through my spinal problems and I began to say, oh, what do you call this? Lumbar. Oh, but this is thoracic. Oh, and this is cervical. And then I begin to say, my gosh, this is, you know, the third, fourth, and fifth chakra in the West. So I wanted to show this. Um, I didn't include the head for the sixth, but you can imagine it there. And then I wanted to talk a little bit. Edgar Casey goes through all of these past lives and a lot of them are in Atlantis and he comes back with recommendations about what the person did wrong and what they needed to do different and the bottom line was always what do you need to do to get over your ailment in this life right now but he comes back and brings back all of this other information um, about Atlantis about um, he was a very um, devoid Christian, so a, a lot of what he brings out back is correlations to Christianity and <laughs> explanations of the Book of Revelation, which a lot of people take to be prophetic, but you can take it to be really symbolic of um, an, an initiation. So he talks, and when I started pondering all of this, there were no books on chakras out. Now you go and you find shelves full of them, right? There was nothing. The only thing I knew was what I learned when I was in, in my 20s, that 
chakras align to, to the endocrine system. And I thought that was a very strange thing to say, but Edgar Cayce says, says the same thing. And he, he aligns them to, to, the, to the glands. And he also aligns them, and then he aligns the glands to the churches, the seven churches in, in the apocalypse. Now, I have not dived in to understand it, and I'm sure there's a lot of understanding that needs to happen there. Um, I haven't done that. I'm, I'm showing you this mostly to tell you that at the time of Christ, it all came together. These were the people who wrote the Gospels were mystics. They had gone through initiation either in that life or in previous lives. And all of that knowledge is what was getting taught when you were studying to become an initiate. So, <clears throat> and, and mostly I wanted to show the alignment between the glands and the chakras, because if you look at the Greek world word for the endocrine, it's a Greek word, and it means either endo means inner, and krinos means either krini in the feminine would mean spring, or krinos in the masculine would mean lily. So by spring, I mean water source, right? So I find it amazing that they call the endocrine glands our inner lilies, and then they were also aligned to the chakras, which are lotus flowers, or you can think of them as lilies. But it, it makes sense because if you go within and you begin to have some kind of clairvoyant vision of these energies, they will everybody will see the same vision right and and they are like rotating flowers so it makes sense that they're called that it i just use it to say don't assume that the western world was ignorant of these energies right that's all i'm trying to say and and all my life i tried to go back to the life of christ and reconstruct, reconstruct what knowledge was available then, right? And why did we destroy that step and then start everything as if from zero with going on with Christianity? And, and we created a, a big, big, big vacuum or void under our feet that now we risk falling into unless we resurrect Christianity in a more complete way. And, and here I, I show the, starting with the gunner at the bottom, all the, where the, the glands are. And I have to tell you, when you read Homer, whatever gets translated as I feel it in my heart, they didn't say heart, they said thumus. And thumus is also the word for anger in Greek. So it's as if, you know, it's a feeling that is generated or was by generated in the heart. Today it's generated in the brain. But um, so they were a lot more in touch. I mean, think about this. Homer must have sung, sung around 1000 BC, right? And they were aware of that gland, that a poet speaks to it. And it's more important than the heart in, in terms of being the center of something. So, and this one differs a little bit from what I sent you yesterday, because in the beginning, I was taking the Manichaean mysteries to be in, a, in existence um, at the time of Christ. But Manas himself 
he really is almost a contemporary of Christ. So if you think of the initiation schools as existing in Egypt, existing in Greece, I'm sure there were initiation schools in Persia because Zoroaster was such a great figure um, and must have left a mystical school behind. The what you find in Egypt and Greece is a tension to learning through the mind. And what you find in Persia is more a tension of how to awaken the will. So you can choose between good and evil. Because Persia was very much about sun and darkness, good and evil, the, the dualities that we see in the Bible. Um because the Bible was written during the Babylonian occupation. So the Essenes was the most important and probably the one that was the closest to, to Jesus. And he was probably an Essene himself. I don't know the degree to which rabbis had to go through an Essene education. Anyways, all the way to Plato's Academy, and Plato's Academy lived well into the next, it probably lived for about a thousand years, if you think about it, that's amazing. And some people are reviving it today as a school of initiation. Um, <clears throat> But what we have that remains of Plato is the dialogues, and I don't know to what degree they've been modified by translators, um, but Plato went way beyond that and discussed concepts that you only see in discussions of the Merkaba today about the different solids, the icosahedron and the dodecahedron and how they all fit into one another. But I I only know that he talked about them. I don't know what he said about them because the minute you enter into those geometric figures, you're entering a, a realm of, of magic. And I'm, I'm sure if anything was written about them, it's all disappeared or only resides in the Vatican Library. Um. But Plato talked about Atlantis and Plato talked about the Platonic year, which is the 26,000 year cycle that the equinox takes to go around the entire zodiac. Um, Marina, have you, um, are you familiar with the writings of Dronvalo Melchizedek? Yes. Um, Drew Melchizedek. Drumvalo? Druvalo, yeah. Druvalo? Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, because uh, when you were talking about the platonic solids, um, I I read that book so fast because it um, it explains sacred geom. You, I kept hearing the term sacred geometry, and to me, it explained the sacred geometry to where um, it made sense to me. Um, and you know when you were talking about um, Plato and uh, the geometric figures at, in the Mer Merkaba, I think that's the the he had two two volume books. I think it was the Flower Flower of Life, um, one and two or something like that. Um, yes, yeah, I know the book you're talking about. Yeah, um, I was just curious how that fits into what you're talking about right now. Um, or, or does it? Absolutely does, but we do not have surviving writings from the Greeks on these things. That's all I'm saying. Oh, okay. Um, they might exist in 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 the Vatican if the Vatican decided to save these papyrus papy papyri. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. Um, well, do you think that the the 
removal of the concept of reincarnation in Christianity by the religions was more to keep control over the populace since uh, you know if this is your one shot you know you gotta do their rules as opposed to um, we're reincarnating and gradually perfecting uh, our spirit or soul or, or move towards the um, mission. Yeah, or to take the power away from these schools because these were schools of philosophy really that taught you ethics and taught you what to do with your soul mm -hmm. and mo the modern world chose to divide all of that philosophy is one stream ethics is another religion is another um and that way you dive down into the detail and you begin all the arguments and everything and i i don't know i i cannot say for sure why did it happen i this is my next chapter to, to study saint augustine and understand how he managed to influence the catholic church so deeply um and and he was a saint i'm not trying to say he wasn't but he took this passive outlook on the faithful and i think it's a crime because you remove responsibility you know it's I don't know I, I cannot say really why it happened it's just the beginning of it was Emperor Constantine who used Christianity for political reasons he his mother was a devout Christian but he was not he just got baptized or I don't even know whether he got baptized, but he announced himself a Christian for political reasons and then went out to destroy the pagans. Whatever we call now pagan, which is a very derogative term, right? Anything that wasn't monotheistic had to go. So they destroyed temples, they destroyed libraries, they pulled schools apart. It it was horrendous. I mean, we watch what's happening with the statues here now. That's nothing compared to what happened back then. Or even whatever whatever Henry the Fourth did to the churches in England is nothing compared to what happened back then. Anyways, um So following Christ, one of these graduates of the Platonic schools and initiates was Dionysus. The Areopagiti means the judge on Arios Pagos, which was the hill of Mars, where people were judged in Athens. So he started a school, and we owe to him the... Western nomenclature of the hierarchies. Um, there is a, a, a very similar um, nomenclature in, in Sanskrit from the Indian side. Um, Manis, um, actually the Manichaean religion took a lot faster than the Christian. And the two of them fought, and actually that fight culminated at the time of St. Augustine with a persona called Faustus. And this is the Faustus that Goethe picks up in his play hundreds of years later. But it was a battle between these two figures about what is right and what is wrong. And there were others who were fighting with St. Augustine, like Pelasios. Um, it, it was, but St. Augustine prevailed. Um, and then in, 
in charters, and I will go a little deeper on, on this cathedral today. It's a cathedral in, in, in France, and it was built on an ancient temple, on the ruins of an ancient temple to Isis. And there was um, an Isis holding the baby Horus in, in her arm. And it was a wooden statue and it had gotten burned and it looked black. And that's how the concept of the Black Madonna came to be. And then a, a Christian church was built on top of that. Some say uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene on their way to England stopped there and, and did that. Uh, and they devoted that church to Mother Mary. And then that church got burned and it got built again in, in the last edifice that stands today there is a lot written in it architecturally in the statues in the figures in the windows that talks about esoteric christianity this is also the church that has this huge labyrinth on 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 its pavement and a lot of people visit it um but they do so to celebrate the divine feminine and, and other things that are not necessarily Christian um, in, the, in the church's way of looking at Christianity. And the School of Charters had taught the Platonic path. As, as far as we know. So it was um, uh, the survival of the Plato Plato's Academy. It's almost like it moved there and, and continued there. And then you have the mythical knights and King Arthur's Round Table. It touches a little bit the um, story of the Grail, and that's in the 500s, 600s, 700s. Um, and then you have the Rosicrucian um, connection to the Grail, and that Rosicrucian school survives today, definitely in the spiritual realm, Definitely in Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy. I don't know if there is other Rosicrucian schools as well. Maybe, maybe there are. And and finally, you have the Knights Templars in in Malta. And all of these are esoteric schools of esoteric Christianity. I'm sure there is a lot more. I just touched on on the main ones that I could see. So the seven, the reason I said the School of Charters had to do with a platonic education is they teach the seven liberal arts the way the Platon Plato's Academy did. And that was education that was a must to become an initiate. And it starts with grammar, then moves to dialectics and rhetoric, then music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. And, and in the geometry, I bet you they also taught sacred geometry. Because all of Egypt, and potentially all the early cathedrals, were built based on sacred geometry. Um, and then in that school, they would align each of these to one of the spheres. What they call sphere of the moon is if you were to look at the 
orbit of the moon and imagine it in three dimensions as a sphere, right? So when you leave Earth, which is a sphere, and these people knew it was a sphere, they didn't think of it as flat. When you leave Earth, the next sphere you encounter is the moon, and the one after that is Mercury, and the one after that is Venus. And it, it goes back to the... The image I had of the seven um, luminaries and, and how they decrease in orbit around the circle. But if you go inside, you build the star that defines the week. And, and then a master of each of each of these that we know to this day. I I I show here. But again, the idea was that you use knowledge as a way to purify the self so it can go within and encounter the virgin side of the self, which today we call the upper self. Now, uh, the Manichaean school would have been very different because they didn't use education. They used the mastery of will. And I would say if you go to the East and look at the schooling of the samurai, for example, that too is the mastering of the will, right? So it would be similar to, to that. That would be my guess. It's just a different path. And you have the path of, of learning, of thinking, the path of will and then you have the path of the heart and it's probably that the christian church tried to use that third path the path of the heart and it, it is a path i mean drew melchizedek talks about the heart meditation a lot and and walks you through it so that Two is a path, but uh, so it, it could be that Christianity tried to be on that third path, and, and that's why it broke away from the other two. I don't know. So here I talk a little bit more about Dionysius. Um, I, I was raised in Athens in a Catholic church that was called St. Dionysius, so I I connect to him. <laughs> but he he's claimed to have started that that school in in the in the Sharps area. And he was an initiate at that time. You you had your choice to do Greek, Egyptian, um, Persian. There there were a lot of options for for initiation, and some people took multiple ones. So, Iliopolis is on the Upper Nile, and apparently it experienced the darkening of the skies and the earthquakes at the time of the death of Christ. He knew not what that was until later he met Apostle Paul in Athens and and he connected the dots. And he, through all of his initiations, had decided that there is an unknown God that is above and beyond anything, any I would call it pagan um, deity, although I don't look down on the pagans myself. Um, and then when Paul came to Athens, he noticed that inscription on the hill of the Acropolis, and he said, my gosh, you guys are really ready to receive Christ. And um, the saying about St. Dionysius is that he 
not only he was there and attended to Mother Mary on her death, but um, he went to France when he was a hundred years old already, and um, he was executed when he was a hundred and ten, and that he climbed that hill effortlessly and they decapitated him and he picked up his head and walked to spring to wash it and then lay down to die and this is something that is said about a lot of saints it, um, the the founders of Zurich had the same um experience they were Christians and they were prosecuted for being Christians and they 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 took their head and walked up the hill holding the head on their breast and I think that's a symbolic thing that says you need to combine the heart and the mind they need to be in sync together so I don't think that that necessarily happened but I do think it's a symbolic tale that says until you lower your head to listen to your heart you're not there right but I, I think it's a wonderful story and I don't know that he was 110 I know that even in my lifetime like my mother-in-law she didn't know exactly the year she was born she postulated it right because it wasn't, nobody was taking a record of a birth <laughs> or getting a birth certificate until uh, until the mid 20th century in, in those parts of the world. So maybe he was 110, maybe not. Okay, and he defines the celestial hierarchies. And... So thrones, cherubim, seraphim is the first hierarchy, the highest, according to Dionysius. Um, Exousia, dynamis, kyriotites, we call them, vir the Catholic Church calls them virtues, powers, dominions. Um, but Rudolf Steiner, instead of virtues, calls the exousia Elohim. So... And then the lower third hierarchy is the angel, archangel, Sarke, which are the principalities. And Arche are spirits of time, archangels are spirits of regions, and angels are assigned to guard over humans. And according to Rudolf Steiner, humans are supposed to build the fourth hierarchy um provided we manage to ascend to spirit and and meet the goals of our evolution i don't know that we will do that yet one thing i want to talk about real quick is that the word arche means beginning in in greek so principality is the the principal the one who runs in front of the army right um and in the in in John's gospel when he says energy in a logos that was translated at the beginning was the word but I don't think that's a correct translation first of all because the verb is not was is is it's in the beginning is the word but Beginning, you can also translate as primary position, principal position, right? Meaning in, in the rule, in the, in the, the principle is the beginning through the word. So the reason I say this is when you read Plato, you almost have the opposite direction. You have humans trying to, to put goals, and in Greek, gold is called an end or a telos. And that you see the opposite direction that humans take, right? Mentally, 
they create an end to which they wish to go. So it's almost the opposite than the principle, which is the beginning. I just want to mention this because when you study yourself, Steiner says, often reverse your thought, think the opposite and see what happens. And it's like sitting in a car and watching the rear view mirror. Something happens to your being when you do that, where it's hallowed again, right? It, it's emptied of all the stuff we have filled it with. It's emptied out. When you do that reversal, you, you almost see whatever you had inside spill outside and your new inside is hollow and virgin and clean. So it's one of these ways of, of playing out with that idea and, and see, see what comes through for you when, when you do that reversal. And speaking of reincarnation, I wanted to mention, and you see this in so many cathedrals, I just put pulled up this example where you see the, the four evangelists of the canonical gospels and St. John sitting on the shoulders of a prophet. And to me, that means yeah, we can only do as much because there have been our forefathers before I will accomplish so much or stood so high or tall. But is it also a connection between um, the, the prophet and, and the apostle that speaks to reincarnation? I, nobody can answer that. It's just something you need to be open to, right? And I know, for example, Steiner talks about Elijah being the prophet who reincarnates as John the Baptist. Um. I guess it shows that there's not all that many advanced spirits out there that can help us. They have to come back again and again. Okay, and then the keys for ascent that were taught at Chargers were more of the heart path that the Christian church was was working on. Um, and, and Christ taught, right? Humble mind, the zeal to learn, life of quiet, the silent search, that is the hardest thing to do because when you begin to see all of these other things, you want to tell everybody about them. And you need to go through a silent period until your picture is complete. Otherwise, you jump to weird conclusions. Um, the lack of wealth, a foreign land, a lot of the, the people are exiled, right? Are homeless even who, who go through this path. And and love for one's teachers. I love that one. So it's a fusion between Platonism and the teaching of the seven liberal arts and Christianity that teaches this kind of path. But it, it's still goes back to knowing yourself, taming yourself, and that's a way to harness polarities through transmutation, through the baptisms, right? You, you work on yourself. 
So that's all I have for today. It was wonderful as usual. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.